Okay. Welcome class. Here we are in my studio. Here I am in my studio. I was hoping at some point we would come on a field trip and come to the studio and I could show it to you. So we will just have to do it digitally or virtually. Uh, so here's the studio. Noah, my son, is filming. He's going to <laughs> he's going to uh, sh show around the studio a little bit. Some of, some figure paintings, portraits, and of course some cloth paintings. And uh, it's a little dark in here, but maybe it'll. Ah, it's looking okay. okay. Some more cloth. Portraits, some old stuff. Books and catalogs, my sketchbooks from college all the way till present time. My brush store. If I need a brush, I come over here and grab a brush. And uh, some more paintings on this wall. And This here is a tabaret I designed and built. Uh, it's got a stainless steel top rather than glass, but it's nice and smooth. And that's where I squeeze out my paints and I paint on here. It's a good surface, so you can use a palette knife. And when I want to clean it, I have this little handy pull-out drawer with my phone book. And so I just scrape the paint off when I'm done, wipe it on here, and then throw that piece of paper away, and phone book works great. Uh, technique I learned from printmakers way back when. Here's my normal paint and my medium, and some mineral spirits, and then in here is my paint store. Pretty lovely. It's like a candy store but paint. There's some of the bigger tubes and the pigments that I showed you on the first day that I've never really done anything with, but there they are and they're beautiful. Over here I've got I've got a slot just for Q-tips, of course, right? You can't have you can't have a studio without Q-tips and pencils and drawing materials and anything you need. I put everything on wheel, wheels so that I can push it around and move it. My easel, here's my easel, nice sturdy easel. And then I have my computer desk. I, I used to paint using this music stand and I would put a photograph, I would print it out and uh, I could paint at night or, or whatever lighting conditions because I'd have a photograph, but it was always frustrating because the photographs never printed out quite right. So now, I have a, a screen right here, and I can just look at the computer screen, and it's much better quality and better color, and you can zoom in and really zoom in on a one particular fold, and so this is my uh, oh, files and things in these drawers. You don't need to see all that, but that's my computer table, and it holds my mall stick, so I can work from here and look right over at my computer screen so it's pretty handy so I'm set up I like the, the setup I'm set up pretty good no complaints okay so we're going to talk about today our next assignment which is doing a cloth painting uh, you could choose something uh, really bright and colorful like this purple cloth or this orange one I would suggest something that's not too shiny. Silk or taffeta and some of these shinier cloths are, are just a lot more complicated to paint. So I would suggest something white, possibly, uh, and, and not, too, uh, not too shiny. So uh, you'll, you'll find it a, a little simpler to paint. So let's move this out of the way. 
And let's look at this, uh, these cloth paintings. Let me turn on the light. You'll notice this is a, an apparatus that I just have here. It's got chicken wire and cross pieces, and I, I can arrange the cloth any way I want. And so, for instance, in this painting, it looks like the cloth is kind of levitating. That's just, but I just hang it on this armature, put a light source on it, and then that's what I paint from. So I'm going to cut down the light a little bit so that when we come over here now, we can look over at that cloth and we can paint right here. Okay, as you, as you notice, I've got a head start. I've done some sketching. But in this sketch stage, you could draw just the contour lines, but you could also start looking at those shadows and light areas and, and more or less do a grisaille, but you're using your, your pencil. But what you're doing is establishing your basic light and dark. Here's your, your light side and your shadow side, and you can get kind of something established with your pencil or with your charcoal at this stage. Now, as we're observing this and drawing this, we want to remember some very important and basic principles. And those principles are looking at the way light hits an object. object. Remember, we call it light logic. So if we have a simple sphere, we have a light side and a shadow side. We have a highlight. We have a core shadow, we have reflected light, and we have a cast shadow. Those are the basic principles of light logic. When we're, draw, when we're drawing or painting a more complicated object than a sphere, those principles are still there. Let me grab that. We have light side and a shadow side. We have a highlight, we have a core shadow, we have a reflected light, and we have some cast shadows happening. So the same principles happen in a more complicated object. They just happen over and over again for each fold or for each area. As we look here at our setup, we can see some of these same principles. We have a light side, we have a shadow side, in that shadow side, we see a core shadow going like this. We see another core shadow here. We see a reflected light in here. We see reflected light in here. We see reflected light in here. We see a cast shadow here, cast by this fold. We see other cast shadows in here. So the idea is that we still look for and observe the same principles of light. It just happens uh, in different shapes rather than on a sphere. It happens really multiple times and in multiple uh, places. If we look at just this fold, we can see those same principles of light. We have a highlight, we have a core shadow, we have a reflected light, and we have a cast shadow. All of the elements of light logic in just that little spot, they're repeated in this fold, they're repeated in this fold, they're repeated in this fold. Those are going to be key things to look for and observe to make, sh to make that cloth when we paint it or draw it, to make that cloth look like it's, like it's three-dimensional, like it's round, like it's real, is paying attention to those areas of light logic. Okay, so we're pretty much ready to paint. We've got our sketch, we've got our paint laid out. Um, remember that we paint 
loose to tight. In other words, we start off kind of loose and uh, a little more free. Uh, that's hard to do and keep the drawing or keep the shape, but we want to try and keep it loose. There are a couple of ways we could do that. One way is to start with a bristle brush. It's not very fine. It's kind of a rougher, coarser material. And so we can't get really small and detailed with something like that. Another trick is to take an old, start with an old brush. See how that's worn and it's not very good anymore? You couldn't really paint detail with that brush and you don't want to in the beginning stages. So that's actually a good brush to start with. It, it almost forces us not to try and get too tight, too detailed, too exact. It will keep our edges soft. <coughs> so we could go with either of those brushes. Today I might just start with, <coughs> with uh, that, that kind of old worn out brush, beginning stages. Today I've just laid out my colors of ultramarine blue, white, burnt sienna, raw umber, and I have some yellow oxide. I don't think I need my reds and my other colors at this point. Uh, but as you know, I like to start with either burnt sienna and or ultramarine blue. I like that for a number of reasons because I can get them mixed here and I can get a fairly neutral color that's neither warm nor cool. But if I want that gray to be just a little cooler, I can add a little bit of blue. If I want it to be just a little warmer, I can push it toward the burnt sienna a little bit. Now it's warmer. Okay. So remember, we're going to start with our darkest darks. We're gonna start dark and thin. So that's pretty thin right there. And it's probably my darkest dark. Now I'm going to look here and I sort of have some idea because I've already established some of those lights and darks with my charcoal. I want to make sure I'm really observing what's happening up there. I don't ever want to just make it up. I want to keep observing that constantly. And to start with, I'm just trying to follow where my darkest darks are. Keeping it thin to start with. I didn't realize when I towed this canvas how rough it is. It's a rough piece of canvas. I have to almost scrub it to get the paint down into the weave of the canvas. Remember at this stage, we're really just blocking in the major shapes. So it seems to help, as we've discussed in class, it seems to help to squint your eyes to simplify those shapes into major blocks. So we're not, we're not thinking about the details at this point. 
we're trying to just squint our eyes and see if we can get those major forms, major shapes blocked in. I really have a lot of my darkest shapes in there at this point. Now I'm going to add a little white and just progress. I could add a little white and, and transition some of those darkest darks into a not quite as dark. And as always, because of the gray of my the gray of my canvas, the tone, I can leave the canvas to serve as my value for a lot of those middle tones. All right, I'm gonna switch to another brush so I have one for my lights and one for my darks. So I've sort of switched brushes here. I've added some white paint. It's a little thicker. And I'll just now kind of paint some of those highlights areas, those lighter areas. I could even go a little more white because the gray of the canvas, at least for now, is going to serve as my value for those middle tones. So now I'm, I'm sort of the opposite instead of Kind of skipped those middle stages of adding white to the darks so that I had a middle tone and then a, a little lighter of a tone and then a little lighter because because my gray canvas the tone of my canvas is going to serve as those middle areas so I can kind of jump at this point to my lighter lights So I've sort of, I've sort of skipped those middle lights and I'm going now to just where it's a little brighter white. There should be some places, even this early, where you get a, a sense that this thing is three-dimensional, like it has volume. And hopefully that's because you're paying a, a little bit of attention to those areas of light logic. So, so even at these beginning stages, You get the illusion 
hopefully. But that cloth is three dimensional, has volume to it. And maybe for some, at least on this stage, some spots that are really white. You see, I, that brush is so coarse and big even if I were to attempt some little small details, it really wouldn't allow me to, which in a lot of ways is good. I'm not tempted to go in there and put in those eyelashes right in the beginning. It's making me think in generalities is if we want to put it that way, is th observing and thinking in generalities to start with before we start getting specific. So we're just getting a, a rough block in. A rough is another adjective that might help. Think about it just being a rough. Now here, here's the, well, there are a lot of challenges but the challenges is to be r kind of rough it in but still maintain your shape because when we're trying to maintain the shapes that we've drawn and, and if we think those shapes are correct to keep those edges loose But to not lose the shape. Bit of a challenge. There's a rough end of the cloth. Uh, I suppose I could do some of the chair, or maybe I could come back with my dark. could establish some darks behind there, bring out the contrast. You see with that old fuzzy brush, I couldn't get a sharp edge there if I wanted one, but I don't want one because one, it's in the background, and two, it's at the beginning of the painting. So in a way, by picking an old cruddy brush, 
I have forced myself to keep it loose and soft edged in the beginning. So that's why I never throw away old brushes because they serve. I wouldn't want to use this brush at the end when I'm really trying to put in some detail. But in the beginning, when I'm trying to force myself to keep those edges soft, it may be just the right type of brush to use. Maybe your brushes aren't worn out yet. Anyway, if you have some that are, don't get rid of them quite yet because they might come in handy. You can hear how rough this canvas is just, just by the texture. done with this demo for today and then we'll continue it show you the next stage on another day so does anybody have any questions <laughs> see ya